tell us about your race and all that. Uh, I'm Bob Weistein, originally from Akron. Uh, I retired as a master sergeant after 22 years in the service. I had the Navy and Air Force time. I initially went in 1961, and the reason I did because I didn't want to go in and be a ground pounder. I didn't want to dig the foxholes. And I, for whatever reason, I got in what they called the fleet. Uh, photo interpretation, which was the uh, intelligence end of it, mission planning. I also went, then after went in boot camp and school and all that, I headed off as a 21 year old kid for Morocco, which is in Africa, if you don't know where it is, which was originally French Morocco, which had changed over then to just Moroccan. But at the time I got there, which was in uh, it was either December of 61 or January of 62, somewhere in there. Uh, I was introduced and they changed the name of the city from Port Leote to Canitra because they wanted no French ties. Uh, some of the interesting things I found out there was that I have a thing when I hear the slang African American. My experience, there is no such thing. Genghis Khan, the Berbers, and the Romans in that area took care of all that. They captured land and mixed it, the whole races are all mixed up. First time I went on a tour, I had a guy that was as black as coal, said he was Caucasian. I had another guy that was red hair, freckled, and blue eyes, and he said he was a Negro or black. Uh, so I was fresh out of the middle, you know, just blew my mind. And at the time I got there, they finally abolished slavery. And anybody born, I think it was in 1962, may have been 1963, that anybody born after that time would not be considered a slave. However, if you were a slave before that, and they freed, freed you, then you were freed, I guess. Uh, the other thing is that there was a lot of beggars there, and there was a lot of uh, diseases, and most of the diseases, not most, a lot of the diseases was even uncategorized. I had no idea what it was. And you would see kids with arms that looked like S's or been around on the house. And they were professional beggars. And if they didn't get their quota, then their, I don't know, leader or owner would beat them. And so you had to watch your pockets and everything else because they would pick your pockets and everything else. Uh, while I was there, the Cuban crisis happened. And I happened to be home on emergency leave. And I, it just happened at the last, I didn't, I was going to be there four weeks. And it happened about my third week and I was getting tired and I was wanting to go back anyways. Well, they called me up and said I had to go back. Well, that was priority number one. Any aircraft going to Morocco, I had to go. I was number one on the list above even the President of the United States. And the reason was is that I had all the mission plans and planning stuff for them to attack Cuba. But what we did was all the mission plannings for Europe and Cuba happened to be in that front. And I was the NCIC in charge of that section. So they wanted me back there because we were working night and day trying to put these things together so the pilots would have a plan or whatever they want. Can you explain what the NCIC means? Non-commissioned officer in charge. Okay. <laughs> Uh, another thing in there, they have some of the oldest cities in the world there. And most, or a lot of them are back to BC, before Christ. One I happened to go to, uh, the, the width of the street wasn't much wider, wider than my arm's width. And they would have camels or dromedaries. Dromedaries are single hung, camels too long. They had children dromedaries. And when they uh, pass gas in that, you generally got a spray. So you, when you take it back in these tours, you had to be walk very quickly to look past them. And the smell was quite inviting, to say the least. Because they have no sewage, they would just come out of the walls and drop down. But after you get past all that, you would see this huge door that was probably, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 foot high, hand carved. And you got to remember, this was carved back in BC or something like that. And this thing would open 
and it would be the hugest room, the mosaic everything, wall, floor, ceiling, everything, and that one inch tile, and these people did this, and they were, it was all BC supposedly. Mm -hmm. And then they took us in here and showed us around, but the other thing is, they had the oldest school on record there. Mm -hmm. And it was simply a room, probably 16 by 16, and they had a three foot or four foot shelf, like it looked like all around, but that's where the kids sat with their desk, oh. and the teacher would sit in the middle of the room. And this was in the capital city of Morocco? No, this was, I can't remember the name of the village. No, it wasn't the I mean, the, and they, uh, I can't remember that. But anyways, it, it, that was, and then I went to another castle, mm -hmm. city, wherever you want, and there, the Moroccans at that time had made metal steel of some type, and had made bicycles out of it, and they had where the king sat in front, the four wives sat in back of him, and then the slaves pedaled the bike. So this oh, was wow. like a triangle thing. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how far back then. They said mm -hmm. a long time, but I don't know. Uh, I worked in uh, uh, they have a the Muslims have a Mecca they have to go to annually or once in a while. And they always say, I forget where the place was, they always say, go. Well, Morocco has one, or did at the time. I was there, and the people always had to go there. The amazing thing about this Mecca was it looked like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which was ironic, and they all had to go to it and do that. Uh, one of the things in there, when we were there, I would work in what they called the Fleet Intelligence Center of Europe. I'm sure they called it for Europe. Well, the Communist Party was a legal party there, and we were always warned and told that if we were ever captured, that basically they'd get all the information out of us and we'd be a vegetable and they'd just throw us away. However, uh, which got your attention. Me and two, three other guys got approached by the Communists, and uh, we had quite a fair being questioned in that by the OSI and the FBI and all these other people in the picture, and ran all over trying to find out who the heck they were. We never did find out anything. That was my first experience with being interrogated. Don't want to go through, you know. How long did that go on with that day? Two or three days. Yeah, so it was, now I, I guess basically if I got arrested right now, I wouldn't say anything. I don't, you know, call up my lawyer. I, they're too smart for me. I, <laughs> I, they know what they're doing, I don't. Uh, the other thing we had there in, when I was there, they had what they call the Moroccan Algerian War. And we, uh, it was a very, it was only like a 30 day war. If you call it a war, we sat up on the side of this other hill that was like hill over here and hill here, and we were like over here. And for the life of me, I still don't understand why I ever went there with life bullets being lying around. But this guy that was uh, an officer there, he spoke uh, Arabic or Moroccan. And he said, Oh, you got to come. So he took all this guy, so we were drinking our beer. And I, you know, that type of stuff, watching this thing. The guys, they would jump up, shoot, and sit back down, and then they'd wait for 10 or 15 minutes. And this was a war. It was bang, wait 10 minutes, and then bang from this side. This, so it really wasn't much of a thing, but it was funny, and you know, we enjoyed it. And this was a border, like a border skirmish. It was a skirmish or something yeah. like that. However, and it may have been part of the Berbers. And the Berbers, I don't know if you're familiar what they are. It's a nomadic tribe that claims ownership of Morocco, Algeria, and I forget, there's about a dozen countries. All those countries at the time paid homage to the Berber tribes, mm -hmm. to the chieftains. And I don't know, there's a dozen different chiefs or something like that. And they, uh, during the German war, when the German, Germans came in there, so the story went, that the Berber chieftain comes up there and asks for his homage. And the Germans said, not no, but hell no, or something to that effect. Well, the chiefs and they left the following morning when they got up every other German soldier's throat was slit in bed. A true story or not, I don't know, but that was what we were told. They also, uh, Berbers are huge people, big people, and they ride these huge stallions, Arabian stallions, and they have this big long robe, of course, on them, you know, and they had a game that they played or they would compete 
going down this hill and back up this other hill, and they'd have targets all lined up. And they would ride down, and as they're riding down, they would be throwing these knives, and you know, you didn't see any knives on them at first, and there must have been about 10 or 15 of these targets, and out of nowhere, these knives would appear, and they would throw them, riding at a full gallop with a stallion, and then they would throw it like in front of the horse's neck, or under the belly, or back behind them, or all these other different ways. And I don't know what the grading thing was, but it was quite amazing to see man. And the other thing is, they had it would look like, it appeared like the Kentucky Long Rifles, you know, the old Ram, that appeared like it And they would shoot those. At, and then they would have a contest and declare somebody a winner. I don't want to know. But I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I then, basically, I got out, uh, we were kicked out of Morocco, the Fleet Intelligence Center was, and we were sent back to Jacksonville, Florida. and. Uh, of course, we had some pretty sensitive type stuff. And I happened to catch, got lucky, and be guard on a plane that had absolutely nothing on it. All it has was equipment, but it didn't have anything on it. So when we got, we landed in Bermuda, I played the captain, come on, we'll go and have a beer and all that, because there was nothing on the plane. Well, as we were out walking around the streets, I kept hearing these two English guys talking. And I couldn't find the English guy. Well, come to find out, they were uh, guys working up on the roof, black as coal, talking in English, or, broke, or the Queen's English type mm -hmm. thing. And I thought that was kind of amusing, you know, looking around. We were so sure it had to be a white guy at that time. So my whole, the whole thing in Morocco is that I, I don't know or don't know what a black person is or what a white person is, because it's all screwed up. When I got out, I didn't particularly care for it, and uh, I, went, I was a printer by trade. I served apprenticeship and ran workload presses. I did make ready. I did work in job shops, newspapers. I went to electronic repair school, and then they had downsizing, and that threw me back in the service again. So they have no up for prior service for the Air Force, and I jumped on the bandwagon and got in. I thought I would go in for four years and get back out with some other trade. And by this time, it's what year? 1971. 71. And so by that time, I, after spending my four years, I was in Turkey, and it was just wasn't easy to get out. And when I was living out, I spent the whole 20 years. In there. And you were doing the same sort of thing only for the Air Force? The no, the Air Force, I was a supply, logistics. Okay. I was in logistics. And when I first got in the Air Force, I went to a base called Lockbourne, which is here, which is in back in Columbus, Ohio. And while I was there, they were changing over from Lockhorn to Rickenback, they changed the name of it. And President uh, Nixon was supposed to show up. Well, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in wires it would run, but they did all these things to make it look good. Well, the grass wasn't green enough, so they painted the grass green, and then, of course, Nixon didn't show up. And <laughs> when I was leaving, and to see all these places, they were just brown, you know, they were dead. <laughs> So, you know, that was my experience with that. And then I went to Turkey, and I was stationed in Adana and Enstrelik. Uh, Adana is northern Turkey, and they're pretty westernized. They're pretty easy to get along with. Southern Turkey, which is down in Enstrelik, they don't like themselves. They, they, they're just nasty to everybody. They, they're, they're, I don't know, there's something funny. Uh, you cannot... The, the, the whole time there, you were always going to get the turkey's trout. Everybody there, they wouldn't let women take baths or showers in town. They had to come on base because the water was so dirty. Uh, and we had to have chlorine, of course, to do it. Well, we ran out. We were down to women ran out. So we had to order. The place I was a specialized ordering and priority ordering and stuff. Well, we really got the task into got them on the uh, cylinders of uh, chlorine had to get in, but we had to fly out of the United States over to Turkey. Well, there's a cap on, on these cylinders, and they're a safety cap. And for whatever reason, they okayed it and approved it. Well, when the plane got up in the air and finally got up above whatever the level was, all these caps started popping off. This chlorine started leaking all over the 
thing which would kill you and burn your lungs out and everything else. So the plane captain, of course, obviously just started dumping all this stuff all over the board. And so we had to order it again. So everybody was okay though? Well, I don't know. I just heard yeah. the story of it. And the other thing we had, we had to order part, I think it was an F4. I can't remember what it was for. But we went from Turkey to the United States Navy through the Army of Marines, which one was, to Tokyo, to Tokyo or uh, Hong Kong. We got a part out of Hong Kong and we chased this thing all the way back. Well, these machines were set up for a 24 hour day. Well, we were on like the first, they were on the second. It was like five minutes to midnight our time, it was five minutes after midnight their time. So it was three days and the machine would accept it. It departed and then we had to try to chase back, but it was, you know, it had to reject it in three days. It couldn't happen, but it did happen. Uh, and we chased, it was fun. That, and the one part, we got it back off of the aircraft carrier and it, the guys brought it, on that. somehow they got it out over the Mediterranean. And they were on a carrier, and they took the carrier and brought it straight into our base and landed and all that. And we got to meet them and talk to them a little bit. And, uh, so it was kind of neat. It's exciting for them as it was exciting for us because we were doing this thing, you know, and we had chased us all across. <laughs> uh, I also had a problem in Turkey, there's no planes assigned. We were always fighting to get parts. Well, we always we couldn't get parts, couldn't whatever. So one night I was on the night. And we had this plane that was down for about six months, couldn't get part for it. And, and the depot was just in Spain, in Spain. I had to be talking to this guy, and he said, well, I'd love to get some pistachio in I said, I said, I get you pistachio. But they were a dime a dozen in Turkey. They was a little wild. The guy says, really? He says, how much? I said, I said, give them to you. I said, all I need is my damn part. He says, if you give me the pistachio and a kilo of it, I said, he says, I'll get your part to you. I said, okay. So I had a plane going out to, Rota. So I told, told the uh, captain, the pilot, I says, here's you know, a part going to Rota. He looked at the box <laughs> he says, I don't think it's part. I said, well, it's kind of a specialized part. And he says, oh, God, here we go. He says, what is it? I told him, he started laughing. He says, there ain't no way. And I said, yeah, well, that's what the guy said. It's for a buck or two bucks, whatever it cost me. I said, it was worth it. So we sent it over, and sure enough, he brought it back, <laughs> brought my part back. And the colonel and all them come walking in, how in the world did you get this? We've been working on this. I says, well, you can't go believe it. I said, well, I got a kilo of pistachio. That's, that's the way I got it. He just shook his head. He says, the hell of a way to run an airport. <laughs> and then, see, the other thing is when I was in Adana, which is kind of, I, drugs overseas for Americans, it's a very serious thing to get involved with. And we had the ambassador to Turkey, uh, son, and one of the other guys was a friend with son. And they got, they had some kind of drug, found it in the pocket of the house. Well, the, the tech sergeant ended up taking a fall, so the ambassador didn't go to jail and all that. They, we were assigned then to go two or three times a day down to the jail to take cigarettes or food down to him or anything else that he needed. And in a Turkish jail, they don't feed you. So if somebody don't bring food in, you start wow. with So I'm sure when that guy got out, he was taken very well care of. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. We would have to go down three or four times a day, you know, provide medical things or whatever else is necessary. That's real. And, uh... First, I think we tend to forget that the world's not like the United States. Oh. That was, oh, like in Morocco. I, when I was there, I, when I actually got there, people were living in caves and mud huts. Oh. And, you know, uh, when we, you couldn't walk from the gate to the, to the barracks because of the wild dogs that they would attack you. So you didn't want to do that. But the other thing, when I was in Turkey, they had what they called the Turkey Creed War. And Turks and Creeds hate each other half for centuries. Uh, we were ordered
anyways, the Turkey's Creed War, it came down from the United States, the White House, or wherever, that we were not to aid or help the Turks. Well, I'm going to stop this. You know what? Because I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to turn it over before I put it. Okay. And put it down the way Okay. No problem. See, that's the trouble being retired military. You get a lot of those stories. And the trouble with this is I don't know how to operate him with this guy. Yeah, no problem. This was kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Main fire. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh, I must have a bad that version. Is, yeah. You're going to get your story before I get yeah, it. There you go. It <laughs> Anyways, we, they had the Turkish uh, Creed War there. And we weren't allowed to help. Well, the amazing thing was I was in Tuslo headquarters, where the one star is not allowed. The Turks moved one or two divisions all the way from the northern Turkey to southern Turkey, shut off all of our communications and everything, and did everything overnight, and we didn't have a clue. And they were just amazed about it. Well, they were afraid of a rep some kind of something happening, so the Turks sent guards to put guards around us with loaded weapons and that all around us. Well, these guys were young guys. They were 17, 18, 19 years old young kids, too. And they had all little suits. And the Turks, you know, that's 100 degrees there, huh? with 100 degree humidity. I mean, he's just unbearable at times. And these guys are practically dying out there trying to guard us. And so us, being Americans like we are, you know, we're afraid of them, they're afraid of us. We finally got to start talking and BSing around a little bit, because we can speak a little Turkish every now and then. And then we started stinking out the water tone and coke and everything else. And then we got to be a lookout. The guy would sit down and be relaxed relax and have a cigarette, smoking his drink. And we had other guys out there watching and when the Turk officers would come to check on him, we'd tell him he's coming, he'd stand up and act very professional. And then he'd leave and we'd go back to doing what we were doing before. And then the other thing is, we had planes coming back that would land and crash on the runway. Well, we weren't allowed to do it. Well, we used to, they weren't allowed to use our equipment and all that kind of stuff. They weren't allowed, but we, we could get on equipment ourselves and move it ourselves. And our excuse was, well, we have to have a tow, so our planes can land. Now, none of our planes are coming in because we're soft like that. But we'd go out there and leave. So the Turks were happy about that. We'd got to work our way around it type yeah. thing. And uh, when I was in Turkey, they have uh, the Virgin Mary's house, where after Christ died, she went and lived. And that land is holy to Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And they were claiming to drink of water, whatever else people have been cured supposedly and all this other kind of stuff. For whatever, you know. But what was interesting is that house is probably, I don't know, 20, 30 foot long. The walls were set thick blocks about this long and stood about 20 foot high. It was like a rounded dome and all the way back. And it was amazing because they'd never had any riots, they'd never had any uh, discourse according to them guys in the front over there. And, and the reason is because like everyone there, it was a religious Respect. respected ground for them also. So mm -hmm. they didn't have any problem. I also saw the seven churches in Turkey and I seen the Roman ruins that was there that I didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. They also had Roman ruins in Morocco too. And next page. <laughs> then I went to, well, to the United States, I went to, came back from Turkey, I went to Little Rock, Arkansas. I was handpicked because there was a large theft ring going on in vehicle maintenance, and one of my expertise was in that area. We came back and we, we changed, it was like four or five hundred thousand dollars a year they were spending, they should have been spending one or two hundred thousand dollars, and uh, when we got done, they were spending $100,000 And we got awarded, we got a distinguished award for that and all that kind of stuff. Cheap, not cheap, not good to call Accommodation awards, that's what they were. I got three or four of them. And I got a service now. Uh, but after that, that was 20 hours a day, seven days a week working and doing all this stuff. And they were literally uh, buying anything. And one of the things we had what's called a bench stock and this civilian operated parts store we call coal cars was supplying and that people there would put it on the bench stock and then it became basically unaccountable. Okay. 
But on that, there was one that had a Model T Ford Fender that we know that was good because they had what he was rebuilding. And our battle cry when the four of us were together was that bad Model T Ford Fender is not coming anywhere unless it's registered to an Air Force vehicle. And it never did leave. We finally turned it back in and got some money back out of it. But uh, that was, it was a good time because you got a good sense of satisfaction. You really, you save two or three hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, type of thing. Uh, so, and then I got picked to rewrite the book Procedures on it and came to Wright Patterson and spent a couple of months here rewriting the book. Well, when I went back to you know, Little Rock, Arkansas, one of the guys I worked with happened to go to Korea. <laughs> and they were having trouble with their vehicle maintenance. And Randy was having something, he was in my camp at the time, which is high priority aircraft broke down basically. So, mission and cable. And Randy heard the commanders talking, and Randy said, Well, I know somebody that really is probably the expert of the Air Force. And of course, all four or five of them, I guess, turned around and said, What? Who? Where is he at? She at? Where is he? Even when he's not here yet, he'll be here in about three or four months. Well, they gave him my name, and before I got there, of course, I was going to vehicle maintenance, and that's where this was from, and that type of thing. There again, we went into a 12-hour day, six days a week, and sometimes we had uh, exercises that was longer. And our whole purpose in life was just to slow the North Koreans down because we were expendable until the rest of the forces could get to us, and that was what we were all there for. But when I was there, the Koreans had dug tunnels and solid rock through the mountains to come out the other side to attack, and you know, and that actually happened while I was there. The other thing was the difference was that people in town heated with charcoal on the floors, and if you lay down on the floor. You get charcoal poisoning, and generally there was a, several people that got killed every year. They were warned, yeah. and there were people get killed. Oh. And, uh, electric blankets, we of course we used for barracks because you could look out the barracks and see holes in the wall, and that time you get cold. It was real uncomfortable. One of the big things they, they when you came in from overseas or from some place, you always had several bundles of coat hangers because you always need them. But when you got there, the Koreans would steal them and use them for welding rods. So yeah. it was always gone. You couldn't, you, they, they'd figure out a way to get them. Uh, and how long were you in Korea? I was in a year, okay. 12 months. Oh, that, that clothes wash, you generally had barracks inspection, but over there you didn't. You had a maid or a houseboy, and ours we had females. And they, you would leave your clothes out and your shoes out, and they would take care of it all and clean your own. Which initially sounded very good until you found out what was going on. And one of the first things you found out that all your clothes and everybody else was all stuck in the same sink or whatever and washed, and they never changed it. <laughs> that one day after another, so you spent a year there, and that water stayed the same. They just kept down pouring in fresh. And most of the time, when the time you got back and you went to get your uniforms, they would fall apart and you had to replace them because they were so torn out. <laughs> uh, also, under, I don't know, but they had, of course, during the Korean War, the, the, the Koreans were very appreciative of one another. And then was, they set up a city in Korea, and it was strictly for GIs. Everything and anything G, GI could want was in the city. It was great for the GIs, uh, probably better for the Korean, the average person, because right? they didn't want the GIs running around getting drunk and all that. And the other thing is it, it, you know, separated us, and they didn't have the problem with GI. Plus the fact this GI city had the alarm on, recall. So if and I was, and you'd be there, whatever, and the darn alarm would go off, and all of a sudden you'd look out there, and there'd be busload of buses, empty buses out there to pick you up and take you back to go to work, one else. Uh, I guess and. and, and Closing, whatever else. The final thing I thought was interesting in my little experience in Korea is that I left at eight o'clock in the morning on Monday morning, and or I left at nine o'clock Monday morning, and I revived. I arrived back in the United States 
an hour before I left. <laughs> so you didn't miss any time at all. We were going over the difference. And then I was stationed in Wright Patterson. Oh, that was the other, I forgot the reason. When I was in Korea, for whatever reason, my assignments would not take an assistant. And I always looked like I never had any assignments. Constantly, I kept getting short tours. And I never had a company tour. I never had long tours. I always had the unaccompanied tours. Well, when I was in Korea, the guy, he says, where do you want to go on assignment? And I said, well, I can go to Ohio or something like that. And the guy says, okay, no problem. He came back and said, no way. And by this time, I was fed up. And I said, it didn't matter. And so they, well, I guess it was six months later after I was there, they, I got an assignment, and the guy said, you're going to Wright Patterson. And I said, no way. And he said, yeah. And then I come to find out what, the only reason I got it, I thought, was that I was the only E6 Master Sergeant that uh, on assignments they put up on the board how many got their choice, how many didn't get their choice, and, else, mm -hmm. and how many non-choices had. So I had four overseas assignments and you should only get one, maybe two in your entire 20, 25 years. I had four of them. I never had my choice of assignment. I volunteered to go to like Michigan and up in the cold weather, I got a little rock Arkansas. <laughs> no matter which way I went, I, I never got my choice. Well, I honestly believe that they put up on the sign they had an E6, E7 Select D, never had his choice, never been anywhere he wanted to be, all short tours, no long tours, and they didn't have the guts to put it up there and say, why can't you get that man someplace where he wants to be? <laughs> Good story. <laughs> and then, my lap when Wright Patterson, over the first game, again, they sent me to San Antonio, Texas. I tried to go to Isla. They gave it to me. It was on the guys at the uh, administration's desk. They took it back, sent me to Texas for a year and a half. And of course, they had to be separated again. So and I said, and then they offered me promotion. I said, no. <laughs> So I'm coming back, I'm staying right I here. I went back in the North Pole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I retired in September 87. Okay. Just in closing, is there anything that you would like us to know about your military service or about military positive or negative, about your experience, or you know, if we have students that listen to this, anything that you would like to say about it in general? Hey, it, it, military teaches a lot of discipline, a lot of respect honor duty. Okay. All right, thanks, Bob. Okay. That's great. And if I see if I turn the thing off. If you want those notes, you can have them. Okay. <laughs> I'll take them. Okay, Mike, if you could start by telling us your name and what where you serve and so forth.